Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to your Chapter 5 uh, study review video. Um, so we're just going to go straight down the Chapter 5 study guide. Um, and for those of you, um, you know, kind of paying attention, I'll, I'll kind of give the number of the question as we go. And I'm just going to kind of talk about some of the underlying causes of the American Revolution. Um, we know that th they can all be summed up with basically the mantra or the saying, no taxation without representation. However, there's a lot more details to it than that. So I'm just going to go through your study guide. We're going to bounce around through that, go over some of the answers, and try and get you prepared for our assessment. Um, the first question there, it says, in 1760, how would you describe the colonies? How did the colonists view themselves? Um, and were they happy with British government? Um, what was that all about? So in 1760s, right, all the 13 colonies, all was well. Um, during this time period. They viewed themselves as British citizens. Um, they had their own, each individual colony had their own colonial assembly. Um, they were able to make laws for their individual colony, pass their own taxes, punish people for their own crimes, and all was well. Over the course of the next 15 years, however, things are going to go from peach keen jelly bean to um, just absolutely awful. And we're going to kind of see how that um, takes that downward slide. So that was number one there. Number two asks you, talks about the French and Indian War, which remember was a war between Great Britain and the French and their Native American allies. The French and Indian War, part of the Seven Years' War. Talked about it in class. Watch the other puppet show video about that. Um, the, the British were victorious. They won. And after the French and Indian War, um, they signed a treaty with France called the Treaty of Paris. And they forced um, France to leave most of North America. So all of this land here, um, this was disputed. And it used to be um, the, the French and the British were fighting over it. Britain win, so since they win, they get all the land. So who was the big winner? Who gained a lot of land by um, winning the French Indian War? Well, the British do. They kick out the French, and they start having a few conflicts with the Native Americans that we're going to see more about as the course goes on. Um, speaking of those conflicts, here we are, right? Um, colonists in 1763 started wanting to move west of the Appalachian Mountains, right? They were getting ready to expand. They said, we've got all this new land. I can go get a bunch of land for cheap, start my family, start my life out there. Um, but of course, the Native Americans live out there. They live out there for generations, and they don't really like the British people moving into their land, which is understandable. Um, and this naturally leads to conflict, to fighting. The British just get done fighting a war with the French, and they're like, we're not about to start fighting a war with the Native Americans. So the British King Parliament, they passed the Proclamation of 1763, which is basically this imaginary line that just runs down the Appalachian Mountains and say, all the colonists must stay east of it. They must stay on this side of the Appalachian. They cannot settle west of the Appalachian Mountains. Well, who does this benefit? Well, it benefits the Native Americans. Um, and that's the question for number three, who benefited from the proclamation? And the Native Americans benefited. The colonists did not like it, and for the most part, they just ignored it. They're like, you can't make me. Um, and this upset the British government. This was kind of like, whoa, hey, you know your role, all right? Don't, don't just do what you think you can do, right? Um, so it upset the British government. It's kind of the seeds of our conflict. Number four, um, what was one big effect? All right, the biggest effect from the French and Indian War, um, Great Britain was in debt. Huge, huge debt. War is expensive. War today is expensive. War has always been and will always be expensive. So after this war is done, Great Britain owes a lot of money to people. Um, and because they owe a lot of money, they think, well, who should we make pay for this war? The colonists, right? I mean, we fought the war in their backyard. We fought it for them. We fought it to get land. We're going to make them pay. Um, and this is what really ticks off the colonists, right? This is kind of what sets everything in motion, um, the cost of war. Um, so they start with the Stamp Act, that very first tax on paper products, official documents and things like that. The Stamp Act um, upsets the colonists. They call it tyranny. They complain, they say, no taxation without representation. Remember, the colonists paid less taxes. People living here paid less taxes than their neighbors in Great Britain. It wasn't that they were asked to pay taxes. It wasn't the price of the taxes that they were asked to pay. It was the fact that they did not have a representative in Parliament who could help them, who could vote on these taxes. They had no say in it. So that's number four. Number five, who are the Sons of Liberty? Um, a group of patriots, so a group very opposed to the British king. We would call them radicals today, right? I mean, these were the people leading the protests, leading the attacks, leading the tarring and feathering. Um, so these were patriots opposed to the British government. Number six. Boston Massacre, we watched a clip of that in class. It was not a true massacre, we all discovered and we all agreed. Um, but yet, the Patriots referred to it as a massacre. Why? Well, to 
drum up, to build up anti-British feelings, right? If you hear massacre committed by the British troops, you automatically assume the British troops are evil and you'll have these hard feelings towards them. So they used it as propaganda, as a way to kind of promote anti-British feelings. The Sons of Liberty did this to kind of promote their feelings against the British. Number seven, Townshend Acts. Uh, why did Parliament pass them? What were they? What happened after they passed? Um, it was passed by a man, a man named Townshend, led the charge in Parliament, again, to pay off these war debts. And they put taxes on things, imported goods, things brought into the country from Britain, so things shipped in, things like tea, lead, paint, glass, um, luxury goods. How do the colonists react? Well, again, they're upset. No taxation without representation. But instead of violently protesting, they boycott these items. They stop purchasing these items. And this is where the ladies, the colonial women, really stepped up. Girl power, right? They really stepped up and said, all right, we got this. We'll help this boycott. And the boycott was effective. Boycotts are difficult, but they're effective. You don't like school lunch? Boycott your school lunch, but it can't just be you. It has to be like school-wide and for a long period of time, and things will change. That's what happened there. They repealed most of the Townshend Acts, except, of course, for that pesky little tax on tea. Number eight, think about the Stamp Act for a moment. What really ticked off the colonists about it being passed? Again, number eight, they were not so much upset that the Stamp Act was a tax on the stamp on the paper. They were upset that they did not have a representative in Parliament. No taxation without representation. Say it with me now. No taxation without representation. Let's do it again. No taxation without representation. One more time, double speed. No taxation without representation. Right? That is the core of the colonist argument. Number nine, how did Great Britain punish the colonists for the Boston Tea Party, right? There was still this tax on tea. Funny thing about the Tea Party. The tea that was sold in Boston and Charleston and Philadelphia throughout the colonies, um, the cost of the tea was less than tea from anywhere else. It was less than the Dutch tea, right? They paid less for it. Um, they were getting it for cheaper. The British government thought, this is great. We're giving it to them for cheaper and we're collecting tax money. For whatever reason, um, the colonists, it wasn't the price of the tea though. It wasn't the cheapness of the tea. It was the principle of it. They were being taxed without representation. So they got bent out of shape. The Sons of Liberty, they dress up like Mohawk Indians, they board some ships in Boston Harbor, they dump all the tea overboard, they trash it, they send a message saying, we are not paying for this tea. This is not our tea, we don't want to be taxed, they destroy British property. Hoo -hoo -hoo. Big mistake. The British government comes down hard on them for this. They pass the Coercive or Intolerable Acts to punish Boston and the citizens of Boston. Um, and so number nine, how do they punish them? They punish them the intolerable backs. They shut down Boston Harbor. Nothing in, nothing out. They make them pay for all the tea. They shut down the colonial assemblies and put them under British control. Say, all right, no more making laws for you guys. We're running the show. Um, British soldiers, if they're accused of murder in the colonies, say like the Boston Massacre, oh, they get sent back home to England for their trial, not having a trial in colonies, and they send more troops. I mean, they come down hard on the citizens of Boston and the surrounding colonies. We start to see the colonies uniting after this. Um, people from throughout the colonies in Philadelphia and other places, they start sending goods to Boston, shipments to got Boston. They kind of got their back. They're not ready to rebel or anything yet, but we start to see some of the people going, whoa, you might have overreacted to this tea party. We got your back. Number 10, simple question. How does Great Britain try and con control the colonists? Through taxes, no taxation without representation. Number 11, First Continental Congress, uh, a group of delegates from 12 of the 13 colonies, not Georgia, but one rep few representatives from each colony, they meet in Philadelphia and they try and find a peaceful solution. The Intolerable Acts have been passed, things are getting out of hand, they say maybe we can still work this out with Great Britain. Maybe we can still work this out and get representation. So Continental Congress, just representatives from each colony meeting to figure out what to do, that's 12, and then uh, 11 rather, and 12. Um, what was their goal to find peace? Number 13, 1774, how do the colonists view themselves? 14 years later, after 1760, after this all starts, they still view themselves as members of an individual colony. So if you're from North Carolina, you say, I'm a North Carolinian. If you're from Georgia, I'm a Georgian. If I'm from Pennsylvania, I'm a Pennsylvanian. They don't view themselves, all of them, as American. They view themselves as a member of an individual colony. Today, if you ask somebody, if you travel to a different country and people say, where are you from? You'll say, well, I'm, most likely you'll say, I'm from America, I'm from the United States. You won't say, I'm from Minnesota or I'm from St. Michael. You'll probably identify by your country first and then maybe your state. At the time, they were identifying by colony first. That will change in a couple of years, however. Um, 
Seven, uh, 14, how did they, uh, they protested the Stamp Act, so what did the uh, British do? They repealed it, easy peasy. Number 15, the Loyalists, the people loyal to the King, Great Britain and Parliament, did not like the Patriots. What did they think of them? They thought of them as ungrateful, whiny rebels. They thought, our taxes are low, the, great British uh, the British government is protecting us, you guys are whining, get over it, knock it off. Pay the taxes, shut your mouths, go on with your lives. They thought that they were these rebels causing trouble. They did not see all the problems um, that the colonists had. All right, number 15, uh, I'm sorry, that was 15. Number 16, define tyranny. Well, that's just an unfair or unjust use of power. So if a king or a political leader does something unfairly, if they abuse their power. The colonists, um, number 17, thought that the proclamation of 1763 was an example of tyranny. They thought that's not fair. They thought that the Stamp Act was an example of tyranny. They thought that the Tea Act was an example of tyranny. They thought that the whole concept of no taxation without representation was an unjust use of power, an unfair use of power, and tyranny. And then number 18, after fighting at Lexington and Concord, right outside of Massachusetts here, fighting between the colonial patriot militias, the Minutemen, and the British Army, they actually fight. They fight two battles, the very first two battles of the American Revolution. Once that happens, it is on like Donkey Kong, all right? Like, there is no going back. Um, it is clear that the colonists are willing to fight. They're willing to die. They're willing to give their lives for their freedom. Um, and that's kind of where we stop, right at the beginning of the American Revolution. We've seen all those causes led up to there. Um, but once the fighting breaks out at Lexington and Concord, there's no turning back. There will be no, oops, I'm sorry. There will be no, okay, we'll behave, or we'll give you what you want. No, it's done. We're fighting a war. And a few years later, well, more than a few, but after that, um, we will have America. But that's for another time. Good luck on your exam. Hope I helped cover, kind of clear up some of these things. You will do fantastic. See you later.